Stephanie Preigel's garden in San Leandro, California. This garden was designed by Stephanie. When Stephanie was looking for a house to buy, she wanted a large lot with a small house and a big lawn. So she could, as she said, turn an ecological wasteland of a lawn into an oasis for wildlife. And this is Stephanie's before and here is her after. I saw Stephanie's garden not long ago and it is just beautiful. Um, and she also has this large uh, three, three, 1,000 gallon rain barrel system, but I'm not gonna say any more about her garden, but I'll just turn it over to Stephanie now. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, Kathy, so exciting. It is, is there anything you wanna say before we launch into your video? Uh, maybe just that, so I have a lot of information, especially about the green features and I actually put together a little sort of fact sheet handout thing. So as you go through the video, there may not be enough time to, you know, like write down costs or those details. So do know that you can just get that later on. If you go to Stephanie's garden description, you'll see a video that was done of Stephanie's garden when her garden was, or her home was on the green home tour. Um, there's a list of uh, uh, all the, uh, the uh, handout that Stephanie made about her green home features. That's great. There's a list that she put together of uh, all the uh, tasks that she did for the green home um, remodeling and their costs. There's a couple of things there on the website that are worth visiting. All right, should we go now and look at your garden? Yes, let's go ahead. Hi, my name is Stephanie Prugel. I live in San Leandro in the East Bay, and I would like to tell you the story of my home and garden over the last six years. So in 2016, when I started gardening with California natives, my goal was really to turn a dead lot into a wildlife garden and create habitat where there wasn't any before. So in a way to give back to nature. And um, it's been a really amazing process uh, and I have been able to give back, but you know, I've received so much more in return, just in joy and satisfaction. So I hope this video is inspiring to you and also useful for your own journey, gardening with natives and making your home greener. The house was built in 1946 and it's actually not that big. It's just over 900 square feet, but it's on a pretty large corner lot, 7,500 feet. So I have a lot of room to garden. In 2016, the front side and backyard looked like this, all grass and weeds and a few non-native shrubs. First thing I did was sheet mulch everything. And here you see the very first plant that went in, a coast life oak. Less than two years later, the change was amazing. And even though my baby oak looked nothing like a tree, it had grown a lot. The bee's bliss sage was one of the fastest plants, and the California poppies filled in gaps between others. The side yard, the coast buckwheat had started spreading into a thick mat, and that really helped with the weeds. And this is what that same area looks like today. Check out the California lilac, frosty blue. It's in full bloom and at least eight feet tall. Over here, the St. Catherine's lace or giant buckwheat really has become rather giant, but not as big as my oak. That's now taller than the house. Here's the transformation in the backyard. I sheet mulched in the fall of 2016 and then the following spring planted. And this is what it looked like less than two years later. Things had really filled in beautifully. Pretty much from the start, there were things for wildlife like the elderberries here. And you also see monkey flowers and fuchsia in this shot. I really like showy penstemon, they make quite a show. So does deer grass, it just looks really dramatic. Here's another before photo and what that same view looked like last May. That's the month the bush anemones are in bloom and you see them here in the foreground. At this point, most of the plants in my yard are about five years old. Here's a manzanita Dr. Hurt. And here toward the back, there's an elderberry and a Catalina cherry. And those two are about eight to 10 feet tall. 
And here's one of my favorites, also super fast growing. That's a flannel bush. This particular hybrid is the Pacific Glory. And I love it because it looks almost tropical and really lush. Blooms in the spring and mine bloomed as early as January this year and then has several flushes throughout the spring. With native plants, it's really true that if you build it, they will come. I saw that in my own yard, because as the plants grew, so did the number of insects and birds I'd see. I made a point of picking plants so that there'd be something in bloom or offering food year-round. And manzanitas are great because they bloom in the winter when not much else is in flower. So I took this clip in January, and here's one of my first customers, a yellow-faced bumblebee, uh, visiting the manzanita. Remember when I showed you the side yard and talked about the California lilac frosty blue having gotten so big? Well here it is in March and it's in full bloom and totally abuzz with bees and bumblebees and even a hummingbird popping in. I think in June this backyard spot is going to be the place to be for pollinators and that's because the postal blue sage is going to be in bloom. Last year I was able to get these photos because the swallowtail and this bumblebee were so busy getting nectar. Next to the Cleveland sage the other day there was a gull fritillary resting on the blue elderberry. In a shady hidden corner, I'm working sort of on a brush pile with logs that I have half buried in the soil and I'm getting my Dutchman's pipe vine to scramble over the logs and the branches. The idea is to offer hiding places for insects and other small animals and foraging for birds. And I wasn't disappointed. Under one of the logs, I found these adorable California slender salamanders. They almost look like little snakes with tiny legs. One of the birds that like to scratch around my brush pile is the fox sparrow, and he actually let me get really close to take this video. As you may know, the Dutchman's pipe vine is the host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly meaning that the pipevine swallowtails caterpillars must have this plant to survive. I never had any pipevine swallowtails show up on my vine, but I was lucky to get some caterpillars from a friend last summer and I raised them on leaves from my vine and protected them over the winter and was able to release them when they hatched the spring. Here's one that just came out of the chrysalis and is resting before it's taking off for its first flight. My hope is that these swallowtails will actually lay eggs on my pipe vine. Here's the one that you just saw fluttering around on my Encelia and sharing the flower with a little skipper butterfly. The Encelia or California bush sunflower is one of my favorite native plants. I have several in my backyard. It gets about five feet tall. It's super easy and drought tolerant and it blooms almost year round. And the flowers always seem to attract a lot of insects. I also try to keep the uh, spent flower heads on there because the seeds are really popular with bush tits and goldfinches. Like many people, I planted milkweed that's native to my area and I picked the showy milkweed. The flowers are actually really pretty, but of course I planted it for the leaves that the uh, monarch caterpillar depends on. And I was really pleased to see that monarchs found my milkweed. I always wonder how they actually do that because I only have a few plants. 
One thing I noticed about landscaping with milkweed is that it completely disappears between October and April, just now coming back out. And so in order not to have totally blank spaces in your yard, I think it's a good idea to plant it in between other plants like these um, Cleveland sage and white sages. So I feel like butterflies and bees always get all the attention. But there are some really cool other insects, like this little red-backed jumping spider. I think he's kind of still in training because he's only doing a little hop, not really super jumping. But he's still awesome to watch, uh, really cute. And I'm sure he's good food for some birds. Maybe not for tiny guys like this little Anna's hummingbird. But hummingbirds eat insects too, especially when they feed their young because they need the protein. And here I caught him eating a bug. Here is just caught a bug, swallowing it. There we go. And now he's even wiping his beak. Actually, I think it's a girl, female hummingbird. So I'm staying with the bird theme and here's a bird's eye view of my bird bath. This is where I do most of my bird watching because that's where they all show up. Some of my regular visitors are the tiny bush tits. They always bring the whole family and they like to use the top tier with only just a little bit of water in it. I think they really like the sunflower bush right next to the bird bath because they can safely hop in and out. It's really cool to see migratory birds show up in the yard, like the white-crowned sparrows. They usually come around September to my yard. I really like this hermit thrush, and I think it's the same one that's showing up in my yard. He usually rummages around the mulch and the leaves, and he always seems kind of anxious and nervous and flicking his wings. I also see a lot of warblers, but I can't quite tell them apart just yet. I think this might be a yellow or Wilson's warbler. The most colorful birds I've seen are the hooded orioles. And my best sighting yet, this little Townsend's warbler. He only showed up one time. He's a migrant. Never seen him again. So you may now think that you need a bigger yard like mine to make a difference for nature. But I don't think that's true. You may just have a small yard, maybe even just a balcony, or you have a yard full of non-natives and you're just switching out one plant at a time. And I really think every step matters and every plant you plant makes a difference for nature. I want to tell you the story of my side trip to show what's possible even in a small space. San Leandro has these rolled curbs that you can drive on to park your car basically on the side strip. And as a result, the side strip was super messed up and in the winter it would be rutted out in huge puddles. And sometimes pedestrians couldn't even pass by. So in spring of 2017, I blocked off the parking with traffic cones and stuff and I essentially did sheet mulching. And I got these nice moss rocks to just uh, make it clear that there was no parking here, but to not piss off my neighbors too much, I also put in some areas with drain rock where people could park. I planted salvia bee spliss that filled in nicely along with a bunch of poppies. And now this spring in 2022, this is what the side strip looked like. And it was in full bloom at the time. And now a little further down, here is another segment and that is planted with hummingbird sage. Again, I have some moss rocks to delineate where the uh, planting bed is for parking cars to not drive into the bed. And here's a Catalina cherry that's doing quite well here. And the stakes also help kind of put it on the map and visually show that this is a planting bed. Over here by the fence, it's a California lilac pushing through the fence and an island snapdragon. And you know, the funny thing is that now it's me encroaching on the sidewalk, but hey, at least it's native plants. 
The latest exciting news on the parking strip is that the city put up a no parking sign, and I actually got them to plant a native oak as a street tree, a coast life oak. I thought they did a very nice job planting this tree, and I've been deep watering it since. It'll be so interesting to see how it does as a street tree, because wouldn't it be awesome if a lot more street trees were native oaks? The oak came with a tiny hummingbird nest, and of course it was abandoned, but I think it's a good omen of birds nesting in this tree sometime soon. Let's rewind for a moment to 2016 when I got started with my sheet mulching because I want to share a few tips with you. I got all my mulch from Get Chip Drop where you can request free wood chips from Arborists. And while you can't pick the date for delivery and you won't know exactly what kind of chips, it saves a lot of money. It worked really well for me. Because my yard's quite big, I had a lot of area to sheet mulch. And the green area alone uh, hit the limit on what I was able to request for a lawn conversion rebate, but I still got a $1,500 check. I have to say I was pretty intimidated by the blank canvas after all the sheet mulching, and I could have never come up with a garden design without the help of a landscape designer friend and an actual planting plan. Even though we ended up not really going with the plan exactly, it was really important to have that as a guideline. If you're planning from scratch like me, I think it's a good idea to think about how you would like to spend time in the yard. For example, I knew I was going to want to do some bird watching and I wanted the bird bath to be pretty close to the house. And I also wanted to have a patio to have people over and maybe play music and entertain. I also wanted a spot that's just hidden and away from it all where I could sit and work and just watch the action. So the first thing I planned was the hardscape. So this patio was uh, the first thing that went in and the flagstones connecting the house to the patio and then the pathway of that patio to the smaller patio in the back that is my little hidden spot. Really think of your garden as an outdoor living room. And speaking of living rooms, my indoor space back then really needed some attention. I had this old gas heater that was so inefficient and just heated one spot. I even put a fan in place to get the hot air to get more distributed, but it was really not that comfortable. And then the first winter, this is my front door and there was just this huge gap under the door. So it was drafty and uncomfortable and I decided to get an energy assessment to just see what's up. I got a contractor from the Bayren list and one of the cool tests he did was this reverse fan that sucks air out of your house to see how bad your leaks are. He also used infrared photos like this one of my door to see where the cold air comes in with the blue here. Some of the recommended solutions were really simple like caulking cracks around the windows or this uh, sweep for my door. Of course, the wall insulation was a little more involved. I decided on fiberglass that was blown into the walls. And for that, the contractor made holes in the walls that you see here and that were plugged up after the insulation was blown in. For the attic and the subfloor, I used batting, but also fiberglass. So here's the summary. I was amazed how little I ended up paying. There was a really big rebate back then. Shortly after that insulation project, I got my first rainwater catchment tank, 1,000 gallons. But it filled up so quickly that just a year later, I got two more for a total of 3,000 gallons. And I'm lucky in that I have this concrete pad on the side of the house, because for these super heavy tanks, when they're full, you really need a stable surface to put them on. It's really amazing how much water you can harvest. I'm not even using my whole roof surface to feed into these tanks. So look at this diagram here. It's 430 square feet that feed into the three tanks you see here. And on average, one inch of rain on a 100 square feet surface of roof, that'll give you 60 gallons.
So for my system, that means I need almost 12 inches of rain to fill up all three tanks. And last fall, we only got under 16 inches, but even that little rain more than filled up these uh, big tanks. That means water will come out of the overflow pipe, so it's important to set up your tanks where that overflow can safely go into the landscape and not flood anything. Right now I just have a hose connected to the tanks and I hand water. Uh, and when the tanks are full, gravity is enough to push out the water, but when the level's lower, I use this half horsepower pump to get the water out. Here's my cost summary. Overall, my setup was between 4500 and 5000 including the pump. And at the time there were no rebates, but that may change. I realize I'm getting pretty technical here, so how about a few nice garden photos? Actually, whenever I get overwhelmed with my projects, that's what I do and I remind myself of why it's all really worth it. The following year in 2020, I got serious about solar and it took me all year to uh, figure all that out. And that wasn't just because there's so much to learn, but also because it doesn't make sense to make your own electricity if you have gas appliances. So uh, part of that project was to research what kind of energy efficient electrical appliances I could get that would replace my old water heater and hot water heater that are run on gas. For the space heating I eventually decided on a ductless mini split heat pump with one outdoor unit and two indoor units. So here's my heat pump outdoor unit with hummingbird sage planted around it and you see the fan spinning because it's taking in air from the outside and extracting the warmth from that air and with the help of a refrigerant then moving that warmth into the house. And it can do the reverse as well, it can also cool, so heating or cooling. Here we are in my living room where one of the two indoor units are and it's wall mounted and I have to say I think it looks better than my old gas wall heater. Um, so the refrigerant that was heated up in the outdoor unit now gets sent over here and the living room air circulates around it, gets warmed up and pushed out through these louvers. And it actually heats very evenly. It's a much more comfortable heat compared to the wall heater that I had before. You use a remote just like your TV remote to set um, the heat pumps and here's my second unit. That's my office and I only have these two rooms heated with the heat pump. I don't have heating in my bedroom and in the bathroom I just have a low wattage regular convection electric heater because I only use it a little bit in the morning when it's cold during the winter. And here is an overview of the heat pump uh, stuff. Uh, the cost was 8350 and that was after the rebate. I also got a heat pump hot water heater to replace my old gas hot water heater and that decision was pretty straightforward just because those two have such a similar footprint. So here you see it, it has the exhaust duct over here on the right that takes in air to extract the warmth and then pushes out cooler air. Otherwise it's very similar in every respect to a gas water heater has a fancy digital display for temperature settings and vacation settings. One difference is that it is somewhat louder than the gas heater. So for me not a problem because I have it in the garage. And here's the overview. It's a 45 gallon and the cost was 5100 and that was after a rebate. Shortly after my heat pump appliances were installed, I also got my solar panels up and running with a maximum capacity of 4.6 kilowatts. I had gotten estimates from four different companies and I ended up going with not the cheapest one, but uh, a local installer who not only seemed really competent, but the people I talked to were also the people who installed the system. And ever since I've been able to call them and talk to them directly, if there's any problems or issues, I feel like that was really important. 
Here's my summary and the cost of the system, which was just under 12000 after the federal tax credit. I also got a backup battery, and you see this black box here in my garage. And that's not so much to have electricity during blackouts, but more because it allows me to use more of my own renewable energy, especially during times when there is no sun. And usually the power we draw from the grid is made with dirty fuels. So by storing energy during the day in my battery and using exactly that energy at night, I can avoid the dirty grid. Unfortunately, batteries are pretty expensive and even after the tax credit and a rebate, mine was still 7300 but for me it was worth it. The piece I'm maybe most excited about is my smart electrical panel that you see here, the white shiny box, right next to the old breaker panel. And most people who add solar and electrical circuits need to upgrade their panels. Instead, you can get a smart panel that just, instead of putting more circuits in, uses the existing circuits more smartly, assigning those appliances that are in use to the circuits that are available. The advantage is that because the smart panel keeps tabs on all the circuits, it's much easier to use them in the most energy efficient way. To explain, let's look at the smart panel app. So right now my system's producing 3100 watts and most of it is actually going into the grid and that is because my battery is already full. And I see that over 800 are going into the circuits. And I can now see which circuits exactly are using how much electricity. For example, the heat pump is using the lion's share, whereas the others are only using a little bit. So if I have only a certain amount of battery left, especially during an outage, this really helps me decide how to use it. I'm a total efficiency nerd, so I love all those charts in uh, the app. For example, I can see how much each circuit used over time, like the heat pump, each month. I can also see how much electricity I used overall over the course of the year and where that came from. So here's my span panel summary. It cost me about 3000 after the tax credit, and I think that's not much more than a traditional electrical panel upgrade. Looking at the whole year of 2021, I pretty much used mostly my own electricity, except for those blue bars, December and January, where I pulled more from the grid than I fed in. But overall, I pushed much more into the grid than I used. Of course, you could pay it next to nothing for that, and it'll probably get even less than the about three cents a kilowatt hour that it is now. But in terms of cost, I'm breaking about even and I have more room for more appliances like, say, an electric car or an induction stove. With all this focus on technology, I couldn't close out without pitching some simple, low-tech, no-investment ways to save resources and electricity. For example, this handy solar clothes dryer. Or one of my favorites, my plastic bag dryer. I just rinse my plastic bags and reuse them instead of buying new ones. And of course, stuff that doesn't have to be made in the first place is always the greenest. Now, if you've made it all the way to the end of this video, I want to thank you. And I really hope you got some inspiration, some hands-on tips, hopefully, some motivation to work on your native plant garden, your green home. If you have any questions and just want to reach out, here's my email address. I would love to hear from you. All the best. Stephanie, that was a fantastic video. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say before we go into the questions that Stephanie made this video herself. Like she just bravely rose to the occasion, as did a number of other hosts this year, because uh, Zoom didn't work so well when we first tried it. So, uh, you know, people who are not professional videographers like Stephanie really spent a lot of time and effort on the video and uh, it was fantastic. And I also wanted to thank uh, Jason Bull who did the drone footage for this video. Yeah, they, they were, Maurice and Jason, it's so cool. I had the, the bird bath, bird's view um, video snippet. So that really made a big difference. And I have to say it was so much work, but it was also really fun because it's the stuff I really enjoy doing. Well, you did a great job. If you ever choose to change careers you have an excellent <laughs> okay video. make a note a garden and a green home video maker so some questions let's see here um your average pg and &E bill i saw has been 14 dollars a month over the course of the year 
Yep, and, and that is, um, I have to say, I didn't mention this in the video, my last frontier, I still have a gas stove. I haven't uh, chosen an induction stove yet. So the $14 are basically 10 bucks for using the infrastructure. If you have solar, that's just what you always have to pay. And then four for the remaining gas, basically just for my cooking. Yep, I wanna say I have solar panels also and have electrified much of our house and our bills have ranged between $17 and $53. Uh, over the course of the last year. And that includes the cost of buying gas for our car because we have an electric car. So we just charge it with our panels. Uh, somebody asked who your solar installer was. Stephanie? Yes, so Suns Free Solar in Alameda um, installed my panels and also the smart panel. In fact, I wouldn't have known about the smart panel if they hadn't brought it to my attention. So, and um, yeah, I really like them a lot. Good. And I want to say that we had our solar panels installed by a nonprofit in Milpitas called Sunwork Singular. And they did a terrific job and were very inexpensive. Um, let's see. So you started by working with a designer. Could you talk a little bit about like how you faced your very large lot and figured out what to do? Yeah, I, I have to say that to me was the biggest challenge. And it it still is because you know, I went about it's like it's not like you furnish a living room and then for the rest of your life, you know, if you want to, that's just where all the chairs are and stuff. Things change. So this original plan five years later, you know, some stuff doesn't work out that great or some things die or you just have a new idea. So it's for one thing, um, uh, an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, I um, basically my um, friend who got into a landscape designing at the time um, gave me some questions and asking, well, what, what kind of field do you want? Do you want it more like wild? What should the focus be? Where do you want to spend time in the yard? So we put down the main sort of anchors and then both just researched a lot of plants that would work in the sun or I have mostly sun. So the conditions I have and sort of what height they would be or you want it a little lower over here because it's right around the patio. Well, and then we had some options and, and you know, I picked a lot of plants that I had never even seen in, in real life. And then they don't stick to the label, you know, like those Encelia bushes that I so love, they were supposed to be like three feet tall, you know, very <laughs> short actually. Now they're like these trees. So, so just expect for things to turn out different and, and um, it's probably fine. Okay, let's see. Um, I wanna say that people can read about Stephanie's garden. You can see her plant list on the garden tours website. If you go to view the 2022 gardens, you'll see her description. Stephanie has made a couple of videos in the past and PowerPoint presentations. So if you'd like to see them, you can go to the tours YouTube channel and search on uh, Stephanie Kroegel. Uh, I think you could find them. I just spotted a question about the, the tanks. So um, I hired um, a one man company to basically install the second round of tanks and a gray water landscape design uh, uh, is the name kind of long. I'll put the, the, the contact info on that download um, PDF that, that uh, there's a link on the garden um, tours page, but I'll also put in the chat later. Um, so uh, that's who put them together, basically connected the downspouts and put the first flush device in and all of that. Um, there was also a question about watering. And I have to say, so with the, I talked a little bit about it in the video, the tank water, I don't know if there's a way to hook it up to drip irrigation, if you have that, and now you may be getting a big rainwater tank. I have not done that yet with mine. I've actually just hand watered, which I've also found to be good because you can, it takes a lot of time, but you will just give water exactly to those plants that need it. Because some, I don't water anymore. My manzanitas, the ceanothus, not that much. Uh, while other plants, like say the penstemon, often need more water. So with hand watering, even compared to drip irrigation, you can just adjust the dosage more. So, so that much on my watering. So I wanna suggest again that I see there's lots of questions and a lot of these questions have been answered. If you go to, to Stephanie's uh, garden page, if you look at on the tourist website at bringingbackthenatives.net, go to view the in-person gardens, 
look on the left hand side, that's the, the uh, Bayside Gardens, go down to San Leandro, you'll find Stephanie and go down about two thirds of the way and you'll find many links to videos, handouts, uh, summaries, contractors, phone numbers, links to people who did her installation and costs on that page. So Stephanie, I wanna say you just did a fantastic job. The presentation was great. So was the information. It was great to see your garden. So thank you so much for making the presentation. Thanks and thank you for giving me the stage. So somebody asked who, who installed Stephanie's heat pump systems and it was Eco Performance Builders and they also installed my heat pump for heating and cooling my house. Um, Stephanie and I both wanted to get our homes off gas and to install appliances and systems that would be powered by electricity. We both installed solar panels. We both had our old gas furnaces removed. We both installed heat pumps for heating and cooling air. We would never have bought air conditioning, either one of us, but it's been great to have it on some days. And Stephanie also installed a heat pump for heating water, and we have yet to do that at my house, but we hope to before long. Um, we're so pleased to see that with our heat pump for heating and cooling the house, the energy needed to heat and cool our homes uh, is offset by the energy that's created by the solar panels on our roofs. And um, as I mentioned, we got our air conditioning for free, essentially, as heat pumps work in both directions. They both heat and cool air. I'd like to thank Eco Performance Builders, a home performance and electrification company for supporting the tour. Eco Performance Builders designs and installs projects involving heat pump heating and cooling systems, heat pump water heating, air quality systems, insulation, and the heating up of homes. Let Eco Performance Builders help you save energy, get your home off fossil fuel, improve your indoor air quality, and make you and your family more comfortable. You can contact them at ecoperformancebuilders.com or give them a call at 925-363-4498.